Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. We apologize for the delay here. Uh, so welcome everyone. Before we begin our formal presentation this evening, we'd like to give you a quick how-to WebEx guide uh, so we can ensure we have a smooth meeting. So on the left side of your screen here, if you're on the computer, closed captions have been enabled. Uh, to use them, click that little CC button to turn them on. Now, if you're on your phone, you're going to need to click the three dots you see on your screen and then click advanced and select closed captions. Um, all attendees videos are turned off for this evening to limit distractions. And you might also have noticed that you are automatically muted, but there's no need to worry because during public comment time, you can click the raised hand icon to have a staff member unmute you to speak. On your phone, again, this is going to be those three dots, and then you're going to click raise hand to be unmuted. You can also send us a chat message requesting to speak uh, when it comes time for public comment, and we will unmute you then. Now, if at any time you need to leave the meeting, you can click that big red circle X button on the middle of your menu bar to exit the session. Uh, this is a quick reminder, too, that these meetings are being recorded and that the video is going to be made available online in the coming weeks. So you can review that at your convenience if you have to sign off a bit early. Now, staff are going to be monitoring the chat box this evening. That's the button at the right. If at any time during the entire um, event, feel free to send questions in that chat box and we're going to do our best to respond to any questions you've asked um, at the end of the presentation, again, during public comment. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the mic over now to Elaine Chinian, who's going to welcome you to tonight's presentation. Elaine? Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> that uh, silken voice that you just heard is Paige Barnum, the parks planner, and I want to thank her and Madeline Goodman for doing the tech support tonight and developing this whole thing and Paige for coordinating uh, this multi-agency, multi-partner uh, effort. So thank you all for being here. I'm just going to take a brief moment to um, welcome you. Uh, I am the regional director for state parks. And I especially want to thank our counterparts at DEC and APA for agreeing to enter this process with us. Um, it's going to be uh, an exciting opportunity for us to take a hard look at uh, this incredible historic site and how we can make it, um, we can preserve it and still uh, welcome many people to enjoy it uh, in a way that is more accessible, more comfortable, more informative and fun. So uh, we look forward to your comments and I'm really grateful that you're participating with us tonight in this process. And there will be m many other uh, ways that you can participate. So the, you know, the virtual is a little clunky, um, but we are welcoming you to participate throughout the process and there'll be more on that later. Paige will explain. Um, on the call tonight, uh, I'm so grateful. We have many, many people to uh, recognize and thank. We've got people from the National Park Service, from major universities. We have distinguished authors. We have the APA Accessibility Advisory Committee, the Adirondack Diversity Initiative. We've got neighboring property owners, some press, tourism agencies, regional organizations, artists, and more. So we're thrilled to have you and grateful for your support of this process. Um, we at Parks uh, have the, enjoyed the support in this planning effort from numerous departments, including the Bureau of Historic Sites, Environmental Planning and Stewardship, Regional Operations, and Site Operations. Um, all those people are serving as panelists tonight and can help um, steward this process. I especially want to thank Steve Guglielmi, uh, the DEC Forester, who's been spearheading DEC's representation on this effort and Kevin Prickett from the APA, the State Lands Planner. I also want to welcome um, either themselves or their, or their staff people, um, many elected officials representing this place, um, including Assemblyman Matt Simpson, Assemblyman Billy Jones, Senator Dan Steck, and Governor Hochul's Regional Rep, Seth Belt. Um, we have a few regional commissioners on the phone tonight. Uh, our the parks agency enjoys the support of a regional advisory board called the regional commission and members of them are on both of these 
uh, events tonight and tomorrow, and we thank their participation. Um, and I especially also want to welcome our partner in programming at the site, John Brown Lives. Um, and I want to give a special shout out to Martha Swan and Jeff Jones. Um, that's it for me. Again, thank you, Paige and Madeline, for your work. Take it away. All right. Thanks so much, Elaine. So now on your screen here, uh, you should, once the slide advances, there we go. Perfect. Today's agenda. So we're going to next hear from Steve Guillaume from DEC about the management plan and its development process. Steve's then going to kick it over to Kevin Prickett again from APA, who's going to shed some light on the Adirondack Park State Land Management Plan. I'm going to walk us through the remainder of tonight's presentation, and we will, of course, wrap up with taking public comments. So without further ado, take it away, Steve. Oh, thank you, Paige, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, John Brown Farm Historic Site is located just a few miles south of the village of Lake Placid. Uh, it is located in the town of North Elba in Essex County. Uh, it's in the middle of an area where um, many of the mountains and the surrounding landscape are owned by the state of New York. And John Brown Farm itself is state-owned land within the Adirondack Park. That means it's part of the Forest Preserve and it is protected by Article 14 of the New York State Constitution. Uh, Article 14 includes the provisions that the lands shall be forever kept as wild forest and uh, the trees shall not be removed. The historic site is under the custody of DC, but is managed by the Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation through a memorandum of understanding. Uh, on the screen, there's a smaller scale map on the right-hand side. It shows that private lands border the historic site on the west and the north side. Uh, the Olympic Ski Jumping Complex is on the east side. And on the south side, there are state-owned lands part of the Saranac Lake Wild Forest. Road access to the site comes in from the north. Uh, the west branch of Sable River flows to the southeast corner of the property. And uh, there is a loop trail system on the property. Uh, next slide. All right. So the purpose of tonight's meeting is to make sure that public involvement is a major component of our unit management plan. So what is a unit management plan? It is a document that sets forth the objectives for the protection or rehabilitation of the site's resources consistent with its caring capacity. It helps the agencies to better meet the needs and interests of the visitors and the public. And uh, it must, this unit management plan must comply with the Adirondack Park State Land Master Plan. The Adirondack Park State Land Master Plan is developed by the Adirondack Park Agency and it guides long-term management of all state lands within the Adirondack Park. Next slide. Uh, we have, there is an established process for developing UMPs. Uh, the first step is to develop an interdisciplinary player team and an interagency team. This team consists uh, from staff from the Adirondack Park Agency, Department of Environmental Conservation, and Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. OPRHP is taking the lead in the development of this unit management plan. They have st staff who specialize in planning, natural resource stewardship, historic site preservation, interpretation, facilities management, all part of the team, and other specialists come in as needed. Uh, the on-site manager is part of the team, as is the friends group uh, for the site John Brown lives. Uh, the next step is to get, develop an inventory and assess the site's cultural, natural, and recreational resources. We wanna look at, identify everything that's on the site, look at the condition of these resources, and examine what is uh, working for the site and what might not be. Uh, we are now at the next step on this uh, uh, sheet, uh, obtain and integrate public input. Public input is very important. We need to know, hear from those who are interested in the site. Uh, this meeting is just one of the ways that we'll be gathering public input. Public input at this stage of the UMP uh, process is most helpful because it can be applied to the next steps in the uh, unit management plan development process. Uh, and those next steps would be to identify opportunities for use and recreation on the site. Uh, basically, what improvements can be made to the site? Uh, what can we add to make the site work better for the public? 
we need to always consider the ability of the resource and ecosystem to accommodate public use. Uh, then we will create uh, management objectives and we'll make sure that those management objectives are consistent with the management guidelines we're required to follow. Uh, next slide. Uh, the unit management plan can address all aspects of the site. Uh, the UMP will look at what's working, what can be improved, does something need to be removed or does something need to be created? Uh, I'll go through some of the topics that the unit management plan will cover and these might uh, help uh, spark uh, uh, your comments at the end of the session today. Uh, for this unit management plan, the cultural resources, uh, given the significance of the site, will be the most important consideration for this UMP. How are they protected? How, do the, how does the public experience them? Stewardship of the resources, natural resources, and the cultural resources uh, is also of utmost importance. Uh, recreation use that occurs on the site makes up a significant portion of the total use, uh, so we want to make sure the unit management plan addresses that. Uh, the facilities on the site, uh, both those used by the public and used by the staff for the management and administration of the site need, uh, can be considered in the unit management plan. Uh, partnerships that we have on the site have been important in the past and we uh, sure that will be important going forward, so that's something the UMP will address. And the circulation at the site, uh, basically what do people experience when they first get there? Do they know where, do folks know where to go when they get there? Does the layout of the facilities contribute or detract from the experience on the site? Uh, next slide. Uh, given the uh, significance, the historic significance of the site, uh, programming has been an important component and it will be going forward. Um, sustainability of any of the facilities on the site, uh, sustainability from the aspect of how they're able to be maintained going forward and also uh, sustainable in the uh, general environmental sense of sustainability. Uh, accessibility is critical that we identify any barriers that are uh, preventing full access of the site and how those barriers might be addressed. Uh, staffing, uh, it takes a lot of work uh, to keep the site running, uh, so the unit management plan will identify any uh, updates to the staffing levels that could be needed. Uh, there are a lot of signs on the site, interpretive, directional, informational, and regulatory. Uh, are there spots where the signage is too clustered or is there spots where it's lacking or not clear? And uh, the unit management plan will also consider the utilities on the site and uh, how that integrates into the facilities on the site. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so uh, the uh, interdisciplinary team uh, will consider all those uh, topics and then come up with and develop a uh, draft unit management plan. Uh, one, at the end of that process, uh, we'll have the draft unit management plan that needs to be approved by three agencies, the Adirondack Park Agency, Department of Environmental Conservation, and Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. The first step in that process will be to release the draft for public review. Uh, the UMP will be posted online for review. There'll be a public meeting or meetings where we're gonna explain the proposals that are in the UMP. UMP. We'll have a, com a public comment period so that people can comment on what's in the UMP or maybe things that we didn't include in the UMP that folks think we should have. The comment period will be for at least 30 days. We'll then uh, review those public comments and make any appropriate changes to the unit management plan or slash draft environmental impact statement as appropriate. Uh, uh, we will then provide a final draft unit management plan uh, or draft environmental impact statement to the Adirondack Park Agency Board for their review. The Adirondack Park Agency would then have a separate public comment period of, to review the unit management plan and that public comment period would be focused on compliance with the Adirondack Park State Land Master Plan. That is the main thing the Adirondack Park Agency would be looking at, whether our plan complies with the guidelines set forth in the State Land Master Plan. The Adirondack Park Agency Board will make a determination and vote whether it complies or not. If it is found compliant, then the commissioners of Department of Environmental Conservation and OPRHP will then sign and give final approval for the plan. All right. Uh, 
concludes my part of the presentation. I'll be turning it over to Kevin Prickett. Thank you. Yes, hello. So I'm Kevin Prickett. I'm a planner at the New York State Adirondack Park Agency. Uh, the Adirondack Park State Land Master Plan guides the planning for state lands within the Adirondack Park. Uh, to guide the preservation, management, and use of these lands, the master plan outlines a classification system and guidelines for each classification. The classifications are based on the land's characteristics and capacity to withstand use. The master plan outlines a spectrum of land classifications that range in restrictions. Uh, John Brown's farm is classified as historic. Each of the master plans land classifications includes a definition providing a general description or a broad character of the lands classification to guide planning. As noted in this slide, the historic areas are defined as locations of buildings, structures, or sites that are significant in the history, architecture, archaeology, or culture of the Adirondack Park, the state, or the nation. John Brown Farm is one of five historic areas within the forest reserve. So to put into effect or fulfill the definition of each land classification, guidelines are included to direct management and stewardship. The guidelines set forth allow certain structures, improvements, and uses in some land classifications and prohibit certain of them in other land classifications. Basic guideline number one for historic areas highlighted here uh, directs planning for historic areas to preserve the quality and character of the historic resources in a setting and on a scale in harmony with the relatively wild, undeveloped character of the Adirondack Park. Unit management plans, or UMPs, are the opportunity to institute the master plan's broad goals and objectives uh, into specific management actions. All unit management plans, however, must conform to the guidelines and criteria set forth in the master plan. So that ends my section. Next slide. Yep. Thank you, Kevin. All right. So now we are going to, once my slide advances here, there we go, do a quick crash course history lesson on John Brown. So John Brown was born in Torrington, Connecticut in 1800 to a devout Calvinist family, and they held strong religious convictions. Um, among which was the opposition to human bondage. Now, for most of his adult life, Brown was active in the Underground Railroad, assisting freedom seekers and working in abolitionist uh, circuits with leaders such as Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. So, in 1848, Brown heard about the efforts of an upstate real estate baron that you yourself may have heard of, Garrett Smith. He was also a dedicated abolitionist and philanthropist. So over the course of several years, between about 1846 and 1850, Garrett Smith transferred ownership of over 120,000 acres of undeveloped Adirondack wilderness to 3,000 free black New York residents. And this was done in an effort to circumvent a discriminatory New York state law that was on the books at the time, uh, which required black men to own $250 worth of property to vote. Now, shortly after hearing of Garrett Smith's efforts, Brown's going to move his own family up to North Elba with the intention of helping the settlers to this new community uh, known as Timbuktu. Now, in June of 1855, after a lot of deliberation with Mary Brown, his wife, as well as members of the Timbuktu community, Brown's actually going to leave North Elba and he's going to follow five of his sons to Kansas to join in the debate over the legality of slavery in the Kansas Territory. There, Brown and his sons are going to participate in a series of violent confrontations that are taking place on this frontier between the pro and anti slavery um, forces as the territory of Kansas moves towards statehood. Now, four years later, Brown's going to lead 21 men in an armed raid on the US arsenal at Harper's Ferry in Virginia, uh, in an effort to initiate a revolt of enslaved persons. And after several days of fighting, uh, John Brown's injured and he's captured. He's actually later found guilty by a grand jury of murder, treason, and conspiring with enslaved peoples to rebel. Brown is actually sentenced to death and hanged in West Virginia on December 2nd, 1859, which makes him the first person in American history to actually be executed for treason. Now, as Brown wished, his body is returned to North Elba and it's buried at his farm. Mary and their surviving children are going to remain at the homestead until about 1863, and Mary will actually sell the farm three years later in 1866. 
Now, in 1870, the property was purchased by a group of private citizens who were dedicated to preserving it in John Brown's memory. In 1896, this group, known as the John Brown Association, is actually going to gift the property to the state of New York on the condition that it be used for, quote, the purpose of a public park or reservation uh, forever. Now, here on your screen, you can see pictured at right um, the granite donors monument that is inscribed with the names of those forward thinking citizens for John Brown Association. So on July 21st, 1896, hundreds of individuals are going to attend the official historic site dedication ceremony. That's the image you see here at the front of your screen. And now today, more than 125 years since the establishment of this as a state historic site, thousands of visitors, uh, come and attend annually. So, uh, it's befitting that John Brown's farm is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The register is part of the National Park Services uh, program to support efforts to identify, evaluate, and protect cultural resources across the United States. And whereas the site is significant not only in local and regional history, it's also relevant to our nation's history and therefore is designated as a national historic landmark. Uh, just last year, the site was actually added to the National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. And this is a federal program that works in collaboration with local and state entities to create a national community of sites that have a connection to the history of resistance to enslavement. So this brings us up to the present day and uh, a return to our conversation about the current planning effort. So last fall, a majority of the core team assembled on site and began discussions about this planning process. Uh, since then, our group has began monthly internal meetings and we've also identified some smaller working groups uh, that are going to be really crucial to identifying the management alternatives we will explore in the UMP. Now, the structure of this planning team, the group of folks you see here on the left panel, uh, is actually super important because it guarantees that we have at the table site-specific, regional, community, and statewide viewpoints uh, at the planning discussions. So there have actually been some previous planning efforts at John Brown Farm. Uh, in 1978, in the lead up to the 1980 Winter Olympics, there was a redevelopment plan prepared uh, for the site, and this was in hopes of better accommodating the flood of patrons that were expected to visit the site during the Winter Games and the subsequent visitation from those that would seek out the ski towers. Uh, proposals from this plan, however, were never implemented. And in 1988, the site's superintendent prepared what was called a site assessment and analysis report, and that was to be used in the creation of a master plan. Yet again, to date, there was never a master plan written. So little has actually changed on the physical landscape at John Brown Farm since 1977. That's about the time that this photo in the background of the slide here was taken. Yet it's the management and operational context for the historic site that has changed. Uh, for example, John Brown Farm actually welcomes nearly double the number of visitors today that it did in 1977. So being decades removed from that last planning effort, it's really important that we bring together now historians and conservationists uh, you know, accessibility and social justice advocates, as well as community stakeholders, such as yourselves, so that we can identify how the site's currently serving the public, how we can better meet your needs and expectations, and again, how we can ensure that the area remains consistent with the wild forest surrounding the site. So we'd like to now give you a brief inventory of the site's uh, historic, natural, and recreational resources, as well as give you sort of an overview of the built facilities that are already here, uh, as the UMP's actions uh, for that future planning document are really going to have a bearing on the site for decades to come. Now, as Kevin previously mentioned, UMP management guidelines for historic areas must principally work to preserve the quality and character of a site's historic and cultural resources. You know, those physical and spiritual reminders uh, in history, like archaeology, buildings, landscapes, all those things that are worthy of protection, interpretation, and celebration. So since John Brown Farm became a historic site, state agencies, consultants, and academic institutions in the area have undertaken archeological investigations. You know, that image you see there uh, at the left of your screen is a young student from the SUNY Potsdam Field School Program 
uh, the students came up to the site and actually excavated around the house and the barn in hopes of um, finding out more information about Timbuktu. Archaeology is obviously a really key component of environmental review on state lands as well, say in the preparation for utility works like electric or septic. Uh, of course, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the physical you know, buildings on the site because the complex story of John Brown, his family, and all of his abolitionist collaborators uh, is told through these buildings and the memorial landscape. Uh, at the site, there are 10 total structures that are considered contributing resources to the National Register and National uh, Landmark status that we mentioned earlier. Uh, some of those contributing resources, again, are those images here on the screen, the farmhouse, the barn, and the family cemetery. So much of Brown's uh, family homestead was open for pasture and cultivation while his family was living on site. Uh, today, most of that land has been reclaimed by wild forest and is suitable habitat, obviously, for the numerous uh, wildlife species that are common to the Adirondacks. And it's uh, you know important to mention that while there are no significant natural communities at the site, there aren't any rare or endangered species uh, site staff still engage in thoughtful stewardship actions. Uh, for example, we have a pollinator garden uh, on the John Brown farm that has milkweed, which is a native plant species that's really critically important to monarch butterfly population. As far as recreational resources go, the site provides uh, passive opportunities that are popular with both local residents and visitors year round. There are about four miles of multi-use trails uh, at the site and this network and the relatively level grounds um, across the historic site uh, support activities like walking, photography, and birding. In the winter, you've probably seen people out there snowshoeing and cross-country skiing. So at John Brown Farm, we of course have tremendous opportunity here to continue our interpretive and educational programs and also to expand on those. Uh, it's of paramount importance that these interpretive and educational programs, you know, not only have relevance to today's social context, but that these events are engaging to audiences of all ages and that they're also accessible to everyone. Uh, so we're really lucky uh, at John Brown Farm that uh, we are in regular communication with our official friends group, John Brown Lives, and other partners as well. And so this way the site can host a variety of events and special programs, you know, throughout the year. Uh, the slide here, uh, you can see, identifies just some of the programs that took place this past calendar year. Uh, we have events that commemorate the life of John Brown. We have talks that help promote an awareness of the wildlife that, you know, calls the Adirondacks home. Uh, there are cultural performances and art installations that bring attention to, you know, modern um, ongoing social injustices. Uh, adequate facilities are, of course, uh, a major component of uh, planning and the development of a unit management plan. They are really important to ensure that the site can safely accommodate and welcome not just visitors, but we want to ensure that staff have appropriate work environments so they are able to provide care for all these important resources we've just sort of overviewed. Uh, this UMP is going to really help us as a core team further analyze our existing facilities and identify the administrative we need, administrative needs we have, and you know through this UMP devise a really proactive management plan. Uh, as visitors to the historic site, many of you have actually probably visited some of these uh, places. Uh, for example, the top left here we have the ground floor of the barn. And so you've probably been here to read exhibits or perhaps avail yourselves of these sites only publicly accessible indoor bathroom facility. Uh, this space actually only accommodates about 30 people for a program, which is why you may often see programs held outside under a tent, that image uh, right below. Now the caretaker's cottage, this blue two-story structure on the top right is not only the site manager's residence year round, but it's also the cramped office space that's shared by the three staff members on site and the space isn't code compliant. Uh, three unheated garages are behind that cottage and those serve as the maintenance facilities and equipment storage for the site, the image again below that cottage. Um, also important to mention that as part of this planning process, our team is going to be evaluating accessibility and the physical design statewide, site-wide, excuse me, uh, so that we can ensure that staff and patrons are able to access facilities and again, be able to enjoy the farm's programs. Uh, and activities that it provides. So next steps, where do we go after tonight? I know Steve gave you a bit of an overview, but we'll 
just uh, give a quick refresher. So after the public comment period ends and that public comment period ends March 13th, uh, we're gonna take all those substantive suggestions, issues, the concerns that you bring to us tonight and through this comment period, and we're gonna summarize those into a document and share that material with you. Uh, in a month or so, we actually plan to release a visitor survey, which is gonna be another opportunity for everyone to share their views, experience, hopes, and dreams for John Brown Farm. Uh, into the fall, our planning team is going to continue to work closely um, both with our colleagues and other affiliation groups so that we can coordinate additional uh, public engagement opportunities. Uh, on this slide, you may have noticed there's some bright green text that's just sort of quickly to bring your eye uh, to the additional um, opportunities we have for public uh, engagement and involvement in the development of this UMP. Uh, into winter of next year, we're going to work on identifying issues that will be addressed in the environmental impact statement, the EIS. And we anticipate that early drafts of the unit management plan and the EIS are to be published about spring or summer of 2024. And it's our hope that final documents will be out in uh, early winter of 2025. So here we are, finally, the part of this whole meeting you all have been waiting for. Uh, we're going to turn it over to you. And we want to hear, you know, what particular issues are at the forefront of your minds when we talk about management and programming at John Brown Farm? Uh, there are a few ground rules for public comment before we open the floor. Uh, so first, uh, the time tonight is not really intended to be a discussion between the audience, you all, right, and the staff, uh, but rather an opportunity for us to just listen and understand what's most important to you about this site. Um, these real early meetings are, again, really critical for us to get a good idea and understanding of uh, the community's thoughts on what the priorities should be here. Um, of course, we are happy to answer any general questions you may have about the site's resources uh, or the planning process for this UMP. Uh, so, again, a reminder about how we're going to run public comment here. If you'd like to speak tonight, you can uh, request to do so by clicking that little raised hand icon. Uh, you can also request to be called upon in the chat box. Uh, when you are called upon, we ask that you introduce yourself. And if you're uh, affiliated with an organization, we'd love to know that information as well. Uh, also, we'd like people to be conscientious of your speaking time. Uh, last I saw the participant count, we had over 30 people. So we're hoping to sort of limit it to about two minutes per person so that we have an opportunity to hear from everyone that wishes to speak tonight. And, you know, recognizing that there may be more than two minutes of comments you want to give, uh, you can, of course, provide additional information by writing to the core team via the email address that you all registered uh, for this event using, or you can send us a letter. Um, I think Madeline might be sharing in the chats um, information about that contact information and is also available on the next slide, which I will pull up now. So. Bear with me while I navigate my screen here um, to see if we have any raised hands. All right. Uh, the first one I see is um, Pete Nelson. I'm going to unmute you now. All right, Pete, can you? Hi, Hi Pete, we can hear you. Good. Um, so I'm Pete Nelson. I am um, with the Adirondack Diversity Initiative, and I also am with Adirondack Wilderness Advocates. The route from the John Brown State Historic Site south toward Indian Pass is historic for an, a number of reasons. Um, it is historic in Adirondack history, and it is historic in uh, particularly in African American history in the Adirondacks. So I guess my comment is a question. I wonder uh, whether anyone um, involved with the John Brown site or with the EC has ever contemplated putting a trail that would connect from some of the smaller trails that you have going to the south of the farmhouse leading to Indian Pass and in fact even connecting with the tr existing trail to Indian Pass. That trail uh, contemplated would wind through uh, Santa Clay Lake Wild Forest Territory and go pretty near uh, the uh, likely location for the original Epps homestead. Uh, and since it passes through wild forest, it would be appropriate for that trail to be interpreted 
um, it would make for, uh, a, 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 to me, a, a tremendous historic resource that connects the wilderness of the high peaks uh, to this site and does so in a really historically significant way. So uh, my comment really ultimately is a question, has that been contemplated at all? Paige, you just need to unmute yourself. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I was simply saying that um, we might have staff here on the line that are uh, familiar with that relationship and that would bring that perspective to the table. So I don't know if um, Steve or Brendan or even Cordell um, would like to comment on this any. Yeah, I, I can uh, comment that something that we could consider, uh, it would take amending the Saranac Lake Wild Forest Unit Management Plan to the south, but it's something we could consider. Uh, I had, uh, we hadn't really received comments about that while we were developing the unit management plan for Saranac Lake Wild Forest, but it's something we could consider as part of this unit management plan, but it would need to be incorporated into other ones as well. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. And thank uh, you, Pete. Uh, since you unmuted me, yep, I know it would definitely require coordination with the unit management plan for the Sandic Lake Wild Forest. Um, I will probably provide an email comment with some thoughts about it for what it's worth, but it definitely would be a historically significant route as it has been for a long time. So thank you. Yeah, no, thank you, Pete. Um, let's see. Uh, I've lost track of my screen. Apologies. Uh, wondering if, oh, there we go. Um, I see Joe Martens has requested to speak. Joe, your mic is live. Hi, thank you. Um, so so I'm Joe Martens, um, retired DEC commissioner and full-time resident of Lake Placid now for the last couple of years. And uh, I've used the John Brown farm in probably every, every conceivable way possible. Uh, I go there to bird watch, I go there to hike, I go to cross country ski, I go to the many events uh, that have been held there over the last couple of years in particular. Um, and I have to commend um, John Brown Lives and State Parks for the amazing programming that has been done at the site. I have seen uh, a much larger, much more diverse uh, audience and crowd at the site than I've ever seen in the past. And I've been coming to Lake Placid um, for at least 40 years now. So I've, I've witnessed the site over time. Um, I'm really delighted that you are embarking on this process, especially after the previous failed attempts. Um, I think it is probably there is no more important time in the history of this country than to uh, promote education about our black history. And this site, as you've already noted, is important not only regionally, but nationally, and I would say internationally for uh, its association with, with John Brown and the, and the movement uh, to free slaves in this country. I think there is an extraordinary opportunity um, to uh, develop a UMP that allows for greater interpretation of the site, perhaps uh, more interpretation facilities. Um, and I know I'm, I will put all, memorialize all this in writing and I'm, I'm trying to rush to get my two minutes worth in, but the, I would ask you to carefully consider uh, the caretaker's cottage and the outbuildings as they are the least significant uh, from a historical perspective and whether or not there needs to be on -site, an on-site presence um, as opposed to nearby presence of staff is something that I think should be considered. Um, I think it will be very easy in this UMP to meet all those basic guidelines that you outlined in the slump. Um, 
and obviously they have to, it all has to be done very carefully. Uh, there is certainly a carrying capacity. The site is of limited size, but there is lots of flat uh, unforested areas on the site that could be used for uh, education facilities to bring even greater uh, crowds to this, not crowds, but greater participation in the education that goes on at this site. So I wanna congratulate the three agencies for embarking on the e effort. Congratulate John Brown Lives and uh, the Adirondack Diversity Initiative because you're all gonna be super important in this two year process that's gonna lead to what I think is gonna be a, 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 a bigger, greater and better site at the end of the process than it is now. And it is a wonderful place now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Uh, next, I see Juan. I'm about to unmute your mic. Juan, your mic is live. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I, have, I have been to the farm, uh, John Brown's place, uh, was a while back. And I live here in Connecticut, not too far from the place where he was born. And I have been to many sites related to him. And recently, I also listened to the Daniel Ch uh, Chester French. Uh, they had a, a couple of webinars about um, Casting identities, race, and American sculpture. There were two sessions, and anybody can go on and look at this uh, website and listen to the sessions. And what they are about is how a uh, race is represented in the sculpture, and the way uh, the the white person and again the African American person. And personally, I I like the sculpture that you have on the site. Uh, but I am wondering if you are considering on uh, creating a new sculpture for the site. And the only, my, my only question would be, is the height of John Brown compared to the height of the African-American? But the African-American really is <clears throat> very short, maybe he's a kid, but in reading John Brown's biography, he saw himself uh, at the same level as the African Americans, at the, the slaves at that time. So I was wondering if, if, if that's one of the considerations you have for the sculpture, if there's gonna be a new one and why the, the proportions might be and the representation of the two of them. And coincidentally, yesterday I was watching um, about the Freddie Douglas Park in New Bedford, Massachusetts and I saw the sculpture they created of Freddie Douglas, and it's a very fitting sculpture that represents him, uh, what he was doing there at the time. So I am just wondering about the sculpture and the height of the of John Brown in relationship to the African American. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Would um, anyone from BHS, the Bureau of Historic Sites, or anyone else on the call like to comment um, about uh, existing historic resources, such as the statue. Hi, this Hi. is Cordell Reeves speaking. I'm with Thank you, Cordell. Um, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation. I mean, the, the current statue that is there on site in the middle of the traffic circle does depict John Brown with a young African-American boy. Um, so he's standing with this child and the gesturing of you know his arm around the child um, and the child looking up towards him um, does convey you know, the sense of the relationship there of John Brown as the protector in some ways um, of this child. And I think the statue itself, there's a lot to be explored there when we talk about patriarchal relationships. There's a lot to be explored there when we talk about John Brown's sense of empathy and his own views on human rights and equality. Um, I think there's an opportunity there to further interpret that statue 
and to use it as a talking point to have some of those greater conversations. But thus far in our conversations internally, we have not explored um, creating a new monument. But I do think that there's opportunities to really further interpret what is already there for the public. Thank you, Cordell. I'm going to unmute Sandra. Sandra, your mic should be live. Yes, hello. Can you hear me? I can. Welcome. Hey, okay. this is Sandra Weber, and I'm currently working uh, on a book of the complete history of the John Brown farm. And so I just like to chime in on that last issue about the statue. Um, I think the statue, well, first of all, it was, of course, erected with funds from the John Brown Memorial Association of, of Blacks from across the country. And it really is re uh, represent, representing John Brown's relationship with Black children in particular. And so I, I, I do explore that a lot. And I, I mean, I understand the, the hierarchical relationship that you can also see in it. So there, there's, there are different interpretations, but when you really read the, the literature, uh, the Black literature and John Brown's relationship and concern for the youth in the future, the, the sculptures very well uh, represents that relationship. Um, I also wanted to say, uh, I think Joe Martin said everything I wanted to say. I'm just so really excited about this whole project and and going forward and there's a opportunity for for a lot of great things to happen here. And I also had that I had that thought in my mind, do we do we need to have someone living on the property? I'm not sure, you know, what the original reason was for that and if we if we still need to have that. And another but my another question I had was I'm a little bit confused about the 213 acres that you're saying is the site versus the original 240, which turned out to be 270. And so is 213, is is that the acreage that is designated as historic area? Um, can, can somebody sort of qualify that? Yeah, absolutely. Steve, would you mind taking that question? Sure. Uh, yeah, yes, you're correct. The uh, 213 acres is the area that was classified historic. Uh, the acreage that the John Brown uh, John Brown owned was a bit larger than that. That's some of the land that's classified part of the Saranac Lake Wild Forest to the south. So that was classified wild forest. So that's not part of this unit management plan. It was part of the Saranac Lake Wild Forest one. But but on the map that you show us there that doesn't look like 213 acres that's just the farm buildings and such there yeah it's a little bit more than just the buildings itself it goes a little bit south of the uh barn uh and everything on the the north end fr from there um and th then it covers basically the whole uh lot lines um But, but when you, so then you have the whole border of the whole national uh, register, national thing. That's the whole original 240 acres. Uh, right, some of that, that was in the um, uh, national register of historic designation, but the site that's actually classified historic under the Adirondack Park State Land Master Plan is the the smaller acreage, and that's where all the facilities are, the barn and uh, the farmhouse and the, and the gravesite are in that area. Yeah, I guess I thought that was like 80 acres and the rest was wild forest. Yep, uh, no, yeah, but our unit management plan will, uh, yeah, try to uh, clarify that and uh, explain that. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. Yeah, making those distinctions between right what the unit management plan covers versus the sort of like competing uh, different boundaries that exist at this site um, is helpful information to know that we need to communicate more clearly. So I appreciate that. Um, next, I'm going to call on uh, Aaron Mayer. 
I'm going to unmute you, Aaron. You should be able to speak. Those comments that were earlier, uh, that this is outstanding. I'm proud of the interagency effort. My name is Aaron Mayer. I am with the Adirondack Council. I'm the forever Adirondack Wilderness Campaign Director. Uh, I am uh, a public historian as well as a passionate admirer of the work and the life of John Brown. A couple of things to the point. Uh, one of the issues, as you mentioned earlier, is the demographics and making sure this is a welcoming and inclusive place. Uh, as you know, the state of New York now is majority minority, uh, 65 to 70 percent people of color. Uh, heavily African American, and again, the issue is that of access. Uh, so we talk about land carrying capacity, but right now, access to the very population that has been the subject of not only John Brown, but the Timbuktu settlement, as well as the other settlements that there, but particularly the John Brown site. And I'm hoping that uh, relative to things that could be considered, if you're looking at structures, um, that uh, a visitor center. Uh, of modest size could be considered as a point in which uh, people can come up and not only have uh, access to, as I say, a little bit more robust educational materials and, and interpretative uh, uh, displays and assets, but also connectivity with the universities and education. One of the things I found that uh, is significantly lacking is a lot of the historiography and I've been taking uh, trips here since my oldest daughters who are now in their mid thirties. Uh, in many cases, the stories are all resting on and even part of the story of the narrative we heard here or what I call the conventional historiography that um, uh, uh, really downplays the significance of the people of color to Timbuktu and John Brown to the site. Um, Willis Hodges, for example, uh, who's Rams newspapers, one of the things that uh, the organ basically inspired John and alerted John to the settlement of Timbuktu. So in other words, John Brown came to Timbuktu, not the other way around, and that the effort uh, to support uh, the liberation via the right to vote of the black community is not, again, moving from the savior complex, but to a collaborative complex. I think that history interpretation needs to be revised. I strongly urge that um, the uh, historic works by W.E.B. Du Bois on John Brown be the definitive work that's used uh, to tell the story, but also uh, relative to the history of people of color in the early part of the 20th century with regards to making the pilgrimages and the memorials relative to the comment that was made about the statue that was there. Uh, this money, the monies that were raised uh, for those statues were by people of color, African Americans specifically, <coughs> and it's through their efforts that you have a lot of the um, monuments with regards to the statue and other bronze structures that you see there that are interpretive were the uh, earlier forms of interpretation of the site, but also who raised funds. And so I think that lifting up those those entities uh, and having that robustly rolled in and also that period in which African Americans were critical to preserving uh, this memory, because again, how it's interpreted is critical and key. And, uh, and I think that it also for connection with communities on the outside, uh, it, it again, further restores that lost history and chronology that has been basically uh, allowed to ebb away, uh, you know, due to how the history right now is currently interpreted. In fact, again, you just heard somebody mention the patriarchal side of the statue, but the fact of the matter is that statue was collected. In fact, there's probably a story by uh, early members in the NAACP and other folks when they were raising the funds for that statue could probably find a narrative on how and why that statue is of John Brown, the man, versus an African-American child, not a up here. So there's probably a backstory to that, and I just think that there's a lot of work to do. But I think the most critical piece is uh, hopefully also, and I'm glad that Cordell is on this committee, but this committee definitely, the scholarship needs to be diversified. I think you should be consulting Schomburg or the African American Museum, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, or perhaps the curators at the uh, Underground Railroad Museum in uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, that can help really uh, relate and, and interpret this period, especially the black role in activism uh, that John Brown was very much a part of that can actually give a little bit more to the backstory and also robustly tell the story 
of the Timbuktu settlement, which, by the way, went from North Alabama all the way, if you look at the, some of the uh, uh, parcel maps, over to uh, Mirror Lake and Lake Placid. So um, it's a very significant piece, and I'm just hoping that uh, a lot more care uh, and equity and expanding the conversation of those who are working on this uh, is also added. Uh, but definitely, I think that a visitor center would be a very critical addition as you talk about structures or consideration of structures uh, uh, that could be added to this conversation. Thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, next, I see Liz Clark. I'm going to unmute you. Liz, your mic is live. Liz, are you there? I may be muted. Am there I, we can go. Can you hear me? Yep, you're, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Liz. Thank you. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Liz Clark. I've lived in Lake Placid for about 25 years. I live on Bear Cub Road, so I'm kind of a neighbor. But I um, I also, in my career, worked probably for 25 years doing unit, not unit management, general management plans for units of the National Park System in the Northeast. So the process you're going to uh, is very familiar to me. And, and as I've lived here, I've always been fascinated at how this amazing nationally significant and internationally significant historic site is in my neighborhood. And I think that uh, it would it would really be interesting for you all to pursue, if you haven't already, the po possibility of becoming an affiliated site with the National Park Service, much the way the Tenement Museum is in the Lower East, I mean, in um, the, is it the Lower East Side, uh, in uh, New York City, in relationship to Ellis Island. Um, and I think that an affiliated site would bring an opportunity not only for technical assistance from the National Park Service at a higher level, but also an opportunity perhaps to tie into funding sources as well as to perhaps jointly tell the story with Harpers Ferry. Um, I personally feel that this property could possibly even be a unit of the National Park System, which is, which is related to Harpers Ferry, but I think that would be a pretty big change in the way you run things. Um, and the other thing I think that uh, would be worth considering is whether or not we might have a National Historic District out there on uh, John Brown Road and um, Bear Cub Road that takes in the parcels that were part of Timbuktu um, to expand the, the look of or, or the focus of telling the story beyond just John Brown, but also the context of Garrett Smith and what he was doing here. Um, so that's the two points I would make, a National Historic District and perhaps an affiliated site. Awesome. Thank you, Liz. All right, next on my list, I see Naj Wickoff. I apologize if I mispronounced your name, but I'm going to unmute you. All right, your mic should be live. So, you know, uh, I'm a native of Lake Placid and probably my first time out at the John Brown's farm was around 68 years ago, uh, back when uh, every spring busloads of blacks uh, coming up through the NAACP of Troy in Philadelphia came out to the site and it was and it was very profound experiences um, at the time. And to me, there's no question for um, those people and many and growing numbers since the farm is a sacred site. It's really hallowed ground. You have black and white um, raiders buried together uh, in this site and people who gave their lives to end slavery. Uh, I think in terms of the uh, sculpture, it's important to know the history of John Brown. When he was the, about the age and size of that young black uh, person in the sculpture, uh, he was, um, his father uh, loaned him out to a, a wagon. The guy was taking uh, some wagon and supplies out to the Midwest. And the guy had a, a young slave boy of the same size as that statue and age as John Brown. And they became friends. And uh, but along the way, at one point, on a cold, uh, blustery, dark, wintry night, the um, slave master uh, was offended, got angry at, at the child, beat him nearly senseless and threw him out into the snow where he nearly died. That seared in John Brown, a hatred of saved slavery. His father had been an abolitionist, but all of a sudden it brought home to John Brown. So in a sense, that sculpture is saying to John Brown is saying, you know, no more a little black child like you or anybody else suffer what I experienced when I was your age and size. I'm giving my life to make that happen. 
So there's a, it connects to that part of his past, which goes to another thing that I would like to build on what both Joe and Aaron said is I do think there's a need for an interpretation center. Uh, maybe when you first start coming onto the property, not near the those buildings, but something maybe try to bury down a bit that really can tell the context of John Brown, of Timbuktu, of uh, slavery at that time, and the critical role that blacks played in, um, you could say, forcing the Civil War. I cannot begin to tell you the courage it, it took to go um, the part of the Underground Railroad to flee those farms, to do all the many things that blacks were doing then their told story is not told in the Champlain Valley was a major route of the Underground uh, Railroad. So that is also very much a part of the story. So um, to me, that's why I think there needs to be a place where people can come and really get a sense of the why all this mattered profoundly, because it's increasingly becoming increasingly important in these days of uh, Black Lives Matter, for lack of a better expression, that people are starting to wake up and re understand John Brown, that his being branded by as a terrorist was by this, in a sense, the Southerners are branded, they were trying to disavow him because they were scared. He he nearly succeeded in causing an uprising, rising of, of uh, slaves on the Virginia farms, which was his intent in the first place. and. Uh, so to me, that, that I think that context is important, and that's being um, sort of underscored by this discussion about the sculpt sculpture for the lack of understanding of, of why, it, why it was designed the way it was. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I see Kurt Steger. Again, apologize if I mispronounce your uh, name, or I just lost Kurt uh, with his hand. Oh. All right, Kurt, your line mic is live. Hello? Hi, Kurt. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. You got the name right. That was good. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I think a, a lot of these comments make clear how important interpretive materials are going to be. So if you have the, the statue there, which of course you should, it's historic, but it needs to have information for people and to encourage them to talk with each other and think about things. Um, Two other uh, things I'd like to add, in addition to the need for an accessible, comfortable year round visitor center right there at the road with bathrooms and uh, an indoor space for talks or presentations or films or events. Uh, one thing we got to remember, of course, too, is um, that we have the rural underserved community in the Adirondacks. And I often say, I, I think every Adirondack kid should know about and be proud of the legacy of black settlers and John Brown and freedom and. Uh, the freedom movement and things like that. Um, so if there are ways to make it school kid friendly and also to make really, really good interpretive materials, whether it's online or printed materials like Sandra Weber and Amy Godine's books are gonna be, but or QR codes or whatever, but interpretation is gonna be key. And of course, uh, we'll need a, a wide range of sensitive, thoughtful, smart people to make sure that's effective. And the last thing I'd like to add is um, it's not just an intellectual place to go and think about the history, but it's an emotional experience too. And I think it would be important to make sure there's some contemplative sacred space there too, where you can just sit and think and feel and decompress like other sacred spaces around the world do that too. You know, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem and things like that as well. Um, so, again, just to summarize it, then, uh, let's not forget the rural underserved kids, anything we can do to get them included. The interpretation is going to be really, really important. Let's get a comfortable modern facility right on the road and let's make sure we have a sacred contemplative space. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate it. Uh, next, I see Amy Godine. Um, let me try to unmute you, Amy. All right, Amy, we should be able to hear you. Yep. Hi, Amy. Good. Hi, how are you? Good. Thanks for doing this. Um, yes, I'm a writer and I've just completed a book called The Black Woods about the community that was uh, spawned or generated by Garrett Smith's gift 
Gifts of Land in 1846. And I also curated the exhibition um, up in the barn called Dreaming of Timbuktu, which does approach the story in terms of voting rights and uh, get around a voter suppression law. So I'm very happy that John Brown Lives and Parks made a home for that in the barn. I don't think it's the greatest place because it's kind of hard to get to and it's kind of hard to know it's there. And because this settlement preceded uh, John Brown coming to the area and is responsible for him coming to the area, I wish it, the story of it in whatever form it takes, whether it's this exhibit or a larger interpretive exhibit in a small interpretive center, had a more central role in the um, discovery of his story, a way of understanding his story. So he's understood right away as a participant in this um, egalitarian multiracial effort, this, this suffrage effort, and that's a context that fixes him in North Elba as much as his work at Harper's Ferry. This is a this is a communitarian story as well as a national story. And what we've got that Harper's Ferry and its memorial doesn't have is his stay in the Adirondacks and what it meant to him and his family, but also what it meant to his neighbors, white and black. And to just point to the several black enclaves and small communities that were engendered by Garrett Smith's gifts kind of misses the larger um, impact of their presence on this frontier with their white neighbors and how they abolitionized them in a way. This is a, an interactive story and I think that could be represented in interpretation of the site and it would bring in the Adirondack story, the story of Adirondack frontiersmen that Kurt alludes to. It would um, embrace a wider territory than just this farm and even just North Elba would reach up into Franklin County and all the places where the grantees had their farms. And I just think there's a lot of work that could be done and a lot of interest that could be generated and a great deal more interest for a wider audience coming to the farm to discover this story than right now um, is there. And I'm hoping that will all be all be explored as you think of interpreting the site, both around the buildings that are already there and in a possible new building, which I do hope is, is constructed. And I'm wishing you the best. This is a wonderful initiative. I can't wait. Let's get it going on. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, next, I see Janet Milstein. Janet, your mic is live. Hi, Janet Milstein. Yep, thanks, we can hear you. Hey, how are you all? Um, I would first like to say that I, um, if you could see, I'm just nodding my head as the previous speakers, every one of them um, have expressed so much of, of what I think we have all believe in this park. Um, and so, and I love this place because I too, I, I am here almost every day. I live just down the road. I see my lane on the uh, map. So, because everyone has has spoken about uh, the historic significance on that level, I'm going to address the actual property, if I may, and I think it plays into it, especially when the I think uh, someone had spoken about um, a place of peace and and respite as well. And I would like to see more native plants. You mentioned the milkweed in the beginning, but in in showcasing this property and bringing people to this property, uh, given that it's a land management plan as well, I think we need to, I would like to see more native plants, not just the milkweed, which is so important, but the um, other pollinator plants. Uh, these can be set up around whatever plan is to come. And I support the idea of a visitor center and an expanded learning program. But the Adirondacks and the climate change that we're all dealing with here, um, it would be a great teaching opportunity as well. And um, I would I would like to see that addressed um, in terms of supporting a fall migration for pollinators, for any of the species that are coming out of the woods and flying over the fields. 
Um, so I hope that in the plan that that uh, comes forward, when you talk about the physical aspects of the property, uh, that can be delicately dealt with as well around all these learning uh, scenarios and statues. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. Um, I don't see any other hands raised to speak. Um, I do see in the chat box we have a question uh, from Pete Slocum and I'm going to turn this over to um, DEC for how many years does the UMP pertain uh, usually at, at least five years um, it could be a, amended after five years but in practice basically once it's adopted it'll stay in place until uh, revision is needed and it needs to be amended so could basically in, indefinite until it's revised, probably at, at least 10 years, possibly more than that. Thank you, Steve. Let me keep scrolling uh, through. Uh, one other comment that appears in uh, the chat since a panelist um, is just a note uh, that um, well, we are residents near the farm, so are concerned about the impact. Uh, a quick response to that. One of the, um, you know, things that is considered when we are doing the environmental impact statement and making planning decisions are certainly the impacts that, you know, don't just happen at any actions we take on the site, but the community surrounding. So um, certainly we are cognizant of the need to uh, think about how the site, you know, interacts with its neighbors. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I think Liz, you might have another question. I'll unmute your mic. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I forgot my second hat, which is I am uh, the vice chair of the Adirond I mean, the Elsable River Association, and I, I can't remember the the map at the beginning. But does the property for which you're doing the UMP extend all the way down to the river and include portions of the riverfront? I'll pull up that map, Steve, if you wanna. Um... Because if it does, and you and there's issues related to the Sable River, because we are the authors of the Sable River Management Plan, and um, we would perfect, we would be delighted to, you know, work with you to talk about anything related to the river if if it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, the uh, West Branch does flow through a small section, uh, just uh, several hundred uh, feet of the of the river oh, yeah, is in I the thought. historic site. Yeah, there, there, I can see that now. Um, so, um, yeah, Kelly Tucker is our executive director. You may know to Kelly, but we would be perfectly happy to talk with you all about what any kind of restoration needs there might be in this vicinity of the river. Um, you know, we, we've been getting grants and funding from different sources for work up and down the east and west branches. It also might be nice to take a trail down there so people could see the river. <laughs> I don't know if you're going to be doing a trail plan that includes trail construction. Yeah, that's definitely something that the UMP does consider. It, it, it ties back to um, our evaluation of existing recreation assets and how we might expand those insofar as um, they, you know, of course, jive with the uh, natural resources and the carrying capacity. So thank you for bringing that up. Uh, yes, uh, Paige, uh, just to speak up a second, this is Brenda yeah. Mills, the site manager. Thanks, uh, we're looking into uh, uh, maybe perhaps in future cutting a trail down to the river. Um, so, uh, yeah, we have have been looking into that. That would be a great community asset. It would be really popular. Well, if you'd like to give me a call, uh, you know, call the office, I'd be, you know, I'd love to talk it over with you. Sure. All right, next I see in our uh, chat box a comment quote, Mary Brown's story needs to be highlighted as well. She was very much Brown's partner in all things and deserves great recognition on the site. Yes, excellent. Uh, next question we have is our plan implementation funds available. Would someone from parks or DEC like to take that question? I can take a stab at it, Paige. Thanks, Elaine. Um, so, you know, uh, state agencies get funded every year annually with the state budget process. But what we're doing here is 
Yeah, and I'm, I'm so grateful for these comments. Um, we're, we're going to be developing a really uh, solid multi-agency plan. And once that plan, as, as you may have seen at the beginning, it takes us through all the, the regulatory requirements. And, and, then, and then we basically have, a, uh, we have the ability to move. We, we have the ability to make the changes that the plan recommends. And that means, you know, taking advantage of um, potentially the allocations of uh, capital money that come to the state parks and to DEC. Um, our partners can can access funds as well through the um, regional economic development process and the consolidated funding applications. Um, we can count on with a plan. We can attract more partners to help us. I especially liked some of the recommendations to reach out to other institutions. Um, those that a plan a plan will help us. So it's like. Um, the, no, we don't have funding identified right this minute, but, um, but surely once we have a, a, a plan in place, um, it makes those dollars flow a lot easier. Thank you, Elaine. Um, let me go back. I don't see any additional hands. Um, and Madeline, it's correct me if I'm wrong. I don't see any additional. Uh, comments in the chat. Let me apologize for giving you whiplash as I fly back to our closing slide here. Just so we can leave you with our lasting contact information. Um, but while I am clicking through, I want to thank everyone for um, joining us tonight. Um, one thing is once we close out of this session, you will be taken to a um, quick landing page where you can sign up for our project mailing list um, just to be sure that we have your contact information. Um, or it's also an opportunity to leave additional uh, comments. So um, I don't know if anyone um, from the planning team would like to say any closing words, but uh, again, we really appreciate you joining us tonight. I think this is very informative for all of us. And we look forward to uh, reviewing comments um, as they come in. Again, our public comment period goes through March 13th. And once that public comment period closes, we will work on summarizing all of uh, the remarks you've heard tonight so that you can see all of that information in one um, comprehensive document that you know, will serve as a um, you know, very helpful tool for us as we start to go out into those, again, um, individual working groups or host other public engagement events. Uh, Madeline has also shared in the chat the public information packet once again, and also the website where you will find this recording and tomorrow morning's recording if you want to check out the uh, public comment that comes out of that. So with that, thank you again everyone for joining us and have a great night.